Acting Captain's Log, Stardate 4523.3.1. Our terraforming mission to Doroth 1 has been cancelled and the Enterprise recalled to Starbase 234. Fleet Admiral Brackett would not discuss the matter on subspace for reasons she said would soon be clear. This is the Star Trek Hit or Miss podcast, and no, Mike has not been uh, possessed by some kind of shape-shifting creature. This is DK. I'm taking over for this week, uh, giving Mike a rest because poor poor dears had a bit of a social life this week. So, yeah. So, hello to you on YouTube or the Federation Subspace, wherever you're currently listening to this one. And uh, I'm joined by Sleepy himself, Mike. Do you have an appointment? <laughs> No. Make an appointment with my secretary. <laughs> oh, it's going to your head now. <laughs> also joining us on this episode is pretty much the third musketeer at this point, which is Adrienne. Yeah. Melota. Oh, Far Mike, too much energy. Had, you had to make me host this one. Uh, <laughs> Hello, everyone. <laughs> How are you doing, Adrian? You okay? I'm doing okay. Yeah, it's a good one today. Nice one. And also joining us, uh, I believe you last heard her on the top ten alien ships. Although this is her first regular episode of Hit or Miss, it's Allison. Hey, 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 everyone. And how are you today? I am okay. Ready for vacation. Nice one. <laughs> yeah, so hey, hey, the gang's all here, and now we're going to go straight into Hailing Frequencies Open. Hailing Frequencies Open, sir. Oh, God, there's that voice again. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and uh, oh. because she's a new one on the uh, on the regular hit or miss, today's questions, we're going to find out a little bit more about Alison today. Uh-oh. So don't worry, don't worry. It's, it's you know, it's it's nothing horrendous. Nothing we won't subject Mike to. Uh, first of all, I'm going to ask, what first got you into Star Trek? What was your first experience of the show and what grabbed you about it? Uh, mine was as a kid. Um, my mom and I, although she does not remember, we would watch TNG on TV. And I don't know. It was fascinating. Um, I just, I, I don't know, maybe the new worlds the um something different um i always liked the counselor because i wanted to be a counselor um deanna troy um probably some of it spending time with my mom and um that that thing just started my love for sci-fi um but then i never watched it consistently growing up So when, um, probably back in like 2015-ish or so, I decided to do a full watch through of all Star Trek. And I started with TNG since that was my first experience. And I've been obsessed ever since. (laughs) Cool. If you you had to pick three episodes or movies to show someone that you think represents the best of the franchise... What would they be? What would you What would you go to to introduce people? Oh goodness, I'm horrible with names. Um, one of one, I'm actually rewatching Enterprise right now. Um, one of my absolute favorites is Cabin Creek. Um, I just always love the nostalgia of them going back in time, and mm. um, and I'm really enjoying another layer of T'Pol. The second mm-hmm. watch through. Yeah. yeah, I didn't really care for her the first time, but um, I'm really liking her character this go around. Um, and I think what I like about Enterprise is just it's 
new. You know, they are out there on their own. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, the weird thing is, Carbon Creek not actually a time travel episode. You always think it is, but <laughs> yeah, I, not really time travel. But it's just one where they go back, like they reflect back into the past. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Any kind of episode. feels like it should be though. It feels like it should be like because it's aliens on Earth in the fifties. It just feels yeah. like it should be a time travel thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a good a good episode as well. Um, yeah, so but for me, it's really not even necessarily like the temporal war or rifts or anything like that. It's um, just any one where they like reflect back. I don't know. I like backstory. I like character development. Um, so I enjoy that one a lot. And I should have been prepared for this question if I would have known about this question. <laughs> if you want to just describe the episode, I could probably tell you the title. If you, if um, you yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to think. Yeah. Um, I mean, really, I'm trying to think of like specific s- series if there's ones that pop out because it's been a while since I've rewatched the other ones. Um, so Enterprise is what's like right there in my brain right now. Um, like I'm on the Zindi War stuff right now. I presume uh, you still haven't watched the movies. Uh, no, I've watched uh, like the first three. Okay. Yeah. Good, and good. Just, um, I've been like very, my ADHD distracts me. So <laughs> I have to really be, even with streaming, um, mm. sometimes I have a hard time sitting and focusing on something. I okay. think TV shows are easier because they have natural breaks, but even... Um, even that sometimes can be hard for me to just sit and focus on it. Um, gotcha. Honestly, I can't. Um, Mirror Universe stuff is is great, but you asked me, and of course, my mind just went blank. Um, I think my favorite Mirror Mirror or Mirror Universe ones are, are DS Nine ones. Okay. Um, I love That's... seeing Kira yeah. in that role. Um, I will say with the original series i love any of the um spock centric ones mm. uh he's my he's my favorite he gets me through watching it because <laughs> kirk is uh not so my that's favorite. why you're on this week in particular <laughs> yeah probably i don't i mean we signed up for this a while ago but i'm sure that was probably something to do with it um yeah and um i mean really for any of the Borg stuff. Um, mm. Actually, there was an episode. I really enjoyed the episode in Enterprise, the Borg one. We oh, it. yeah. <laughs> I really, I think that's a really good one because, well, it's, it's kind of cool to see how it gets you thinking about the Borg and, like, yeah. how did they get here? I and think they, we said this in the review, but I like how part of it is clearly inspired by the thing because it's, like, in the Arctic and it's an unusual alien life form and horror element to it so yeah 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 that's all that's all i got for you (laughs) cool sorry it's it's all right what is uh i think i know what the answer is going to be to this but out of all of them what is your favorite series oh it's so hard because i like all of them for different reasons um i would have said voyager but honestly I, i really like enterprise it's kind of a toss-up for different reasons. Voyager was dear to my heart because I watched it during a really difficult time in my life, and it almost felt like family. Like, I really mourned when I finished that watch through. Wow. Um, but I don't know. There's just something nostalgic about Enterprise that I really like. Yeah. I think that's... I, I, I do like that it's been recognized more as a decent series as time goes on. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. It... It used to be kind of like the black sheep of the family, but with streaming, you do get to see more of a, a positive reaction to it these days, and I do love that because it, it's always been one of my favourites. Mm-hmm. I yeah. think the same thing's going to happen with Discovery. In 20 years' time, people are going to look back and realise that a lot of the angry people that were shouting at it were just, you know... Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, agree. I agree. I agree. I'm watching <laughs> Discovery. Night. I'm watching it now, and I'm liking it more. Yeah. I think Once that noise is tuned out... Watch something you know um 
you pick up on different things. Um, you like rewatching Enterprise the second time. I mean, I loved it the first time, but you know, it's giving me. I also think if you're in a different place as a person, to that can make yeah. a difference. So, you know, ten years ago, I might have related more to Deanna Troy, but you know, early forties, I might relate more to someone else, you know, um, depending on your personal experiences, what you've been through, the emotional range that they show in the character. Yeah. Um, and with regards to characters, this is probably going to be another put you on the spot question. So I apologize for that, but I was given the questions by Mike. Uh, <laughs> what I, what are your uh, three favorite characters in the franchise? Okay. Um, data, data, sorry, data. Um, let's see. I really like the, um, EMT, EMT, right? No. EMH. The emergency EMH. medical home. Oh, the doctor. Yeah, he's great. Yeah. I, he, I love him. Yeah. Um, he's probably actually <laughs> my favorite. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then let's see my third one. I'm assuming Spock, right? <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to have to go to Spock, you know, <laughs> and the funny thing is, like I was just saying, like, if you had asked me this five, ten years ago, it would have been very different. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, mm -hmm. Deanna Troy used to be one of my favorite characters. Mm -hmm. You've picked all of the characters who are, like, the kind of, uh, the lens on humanity, the outsider looking in. Yeah. So I well, can probably confidently predict that you also love Odo, Dr. Flox, <laughs> maybe Saru. <laughs> I do like Dr. Flox, I do. Oh, yeah. Um... Yeah, and I mean, obvious. I mean, y'all know what I do for a living and what I've mm. studied, so mm. I tend to like, well, I've already said it, I like character development, but mm. I like, even though Data and Spock lack the emotions, you learn a lot about emotions with them. Mm. So, I, um, yeah, I, I like stuff that shows us like the best and the worst of humanity um gives us the lens so to speak cool there are i mean i think a lot of people have chosen people like data and spot throughout the series aren't they Mike? oh yeah definitely yeah yeah That's interesting it makes you wonder is it i mean i guess it's a combination you know good writing good character development good acting Definitely. Yeah, I think relatability, somebody can, a lot of people can find something that they relate to. Yeah. That, I mean, Spock was one of the three that I gave on my list. And with me, it's just the relatability of feeling a bit of an outsider at times and struggling to feel like you've can have you've got control of your emotions or various bits and pieces you don't quite fit in. So, and yeah. then, I mean, you've got how many years now of backstory under three different actors to, to fall right. back on. So, yeah. And then, uh, what's his name? Bark Barclay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's pretty At really the time, good. I related heavily to him during Next Gen, yeah. 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 Nice one. So, uh, yeah, we've uh, we found out a little, more, a little more about our new guest. So, uh, we're going to go to the next section, and the reason why the show is called The Show, we're going to go to the hit or miss section. What about my performance? I'm not a drama critic. <laughs> and as regular uh, regular listeners uh, to the show will know, uh, we'll bring up a series of uh, subjects, little snippets from the Star Trek universe, and ask uh, everyone on the show if they consider it a hit or a miss. Yeah, some of them are going to be Romulan related, and uh, yeah, we'll see what the what the guests on the show think of it today. So the first one, and because Mike gratefully let me uh, host this one I'm something i'm sure he's probably not going to do again uh we're going to go straight to a ship so uh, yes yes and this one it's is <laughs> god <laughs> this one it's with the sorry with the theme of this ser series we've uh, we've mentioned it before in previous episodes but i'm going to go with what does everyone think to uh the Dideridex class, the Romulan Warbird Type B. And I'm going to come to you first on this, Mike. <laughs> I like it. We have we have mentioned this before. I don't know if it was on the actual Hit or Miss or if I just mentioned it because it came up in an episode or something. Um, but I like it a lot. I think I, I relate more. I relate, you know what I, I, I lean more toward the Bird of Prey because it's more of a fighter craft and sneaky and stuff. 
But for the next gen era, the the Dideradex is perfect because it is. If you're going to have to compare it to the big sort of city sized Galaxy class, you know, flagship of Starfleet, then this thing is massive and intimidating and cool. And uh, yeah, it just it looks good. I love the silhouette. It's one of those things looks good from every angle. I think if you're going to try to be intimidating, and I've said this before. Use a black hole as your power source. That'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, again, I think I've probably shared this story, so apologies if you've heard it before, but I just love that there's that weird um, empty space in the middle, which I never used to think yeah. much about, but one of the Shatner novels has a fantastic scene where a Defiant class ship flies into there, turns around <laughs> basically inside of the dead space and just rips the warbird apart. Which yeah. seems like such a cool yeah. scene. Even though I yeah. read it, I didn't see it. I was just like, oh, wow. Way to make use of that uh, empty space. <laughs> there's, there's, I, th I think there's a similar uh, occurrence in, I believe it was the novel Federation. Oh, I like uh, it. Yeah, it hides inside the middle. And then they just ram it, I believe, from, yeah. <laughs> from the inside. So... The novel I was referring to was um, The Return, if anybody wants to look that up. <laughs> Maybe I'm getting mixed up because I do I do rate well I did rate both of those novels highly so maybe I'm I'm getting yeah. them mixed up but yeah the Defiant class ship in question was the Enterprise E because this is before there was an actual Enterprise E obviously yeah. ah yeah that could be it so I'm guessing this is this one's a big hit so, yeah. from you yeah massive hit for me <laughs> nice one what about you Adrian yeah this is a hit the green the the big like I don't know what that is that maybe a viewport port or something the on the side it looks like an eyeball you know <laughs> i don't know the picture i'm looking at this and the lights uh, it's like a, a a a weird miniature space cruise liner for bad guys because all the lights at all the different levels you know what i mean yeah, yeah that's a hit <laughs> that, that, that's a pretty definitive answer what about you allison I mean, it's a hit. I think when I did the top 10 enemy ships, I had a warbird on there. Um, I usually go by how they look because <laughs> I don't really know a lot of their, their specs and everything. But I don't know. There's always something so mysterious about the Romulans. Mm -hmm. So when you get some kind of peak of them, whether it's just the outside of the ship or um, you do get a peak of the inside, um, it's just, I don't know, It it's intriguing, and I, I agree with Adrian. I like the green as well. Mm. So, yeah, I do too. So that's three for three. I do like the green color scheme. That's the one mm -hmm. thing wrong with the Romulan Bird of Prey. I prefer. I would prefer it if it was green, mm. but also yeah. have the bird on the bottom of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I remember a, a friend of mine, do uh, you remember, did you guys ever see those Star Trek poster magazines that they, they had one oh, yes. episode? Oh, yeah. My friend, yeah, he had some of those, and it wasn't long after the C, uh, TNG started, and he would plaster his wall with these. And I remember there being a picture of the Enterprise uh, D, a picture of a Ferengi Marauder, and this, and this one just it, oh, it blew my mind. It just looked like a a, a city in space. I love it. Mm. I love it as Adrian said. It's like a cruise liner. I yeah. think the design of it, it's it's terrifying. If you saw something like that, you would you would soil yourself. I'm sorry, but mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's a big hit from me. So that's four four positive ones for this one. So we haven't yet had start. anything negative this series. I know. <laughs> so, so you know, good luck, DK. <laughs> people, yeah, people on the uh, people on the Federation subspace are saying, well, they love everything, and yeah, they'll go back listen to some of their episodes and they'll go, no, I was wrong. They hate everything. <laughs> Ask me my opinion on season two of Picard and then be prepared to yeah. hear a right <laughs> Yes. <laughs> okay, so the second one on Hit or Miss, and this is a uh, kind of serendipitous one for Alison. It's a character, and it's Charles Trip Tucker the Third. I love him. So, yeah, we'll start off with you, Alison. Oh, man, he's a hit. Like... The first time I watched through Enterprise, I would joke that I was going to get to know one married to him and Travis. Aww. Aww. <laughs> yeah. um, I think as being someone from the south of the United States, I'm not offended by his accent. He, um, he does a really good job of portraying a southern 
gentleman with an accent from that well-known southern uh, town of florida right which <laughs> is totally not how floridian sound but you know still i like because you know he he sounds like he actually maybe could have some southern in him it doesn't sound put on um i think um he means well he gets into some trouble sometimes trying to do the right thing but i i like his um good naturedness his abs um <laughs> his engineering skills, his loyalty. So he's definitely a hit for me. Nice one. Adrienne? Yeah, I like how um, Connor portrayed uh, Tucker. Um, I love his humor. I love the catfish stuff because, of course, I used to live in Jacksonville, Florida. So I get it. Um, and I think that he, he does well. He also has great comedic timing. Besides the fact that he's loyal and strong and funny and um, he's... I liked him in the episode Unexpected. I know that that episode gets panned uh, where he gets pregnant because he puts his hand in these crystals and blah, blah. But I thought it was great. And that's when I really fell in love with him. See, I like that one because it reminded me of Red Dwarf. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Jim and Bexley. Those were the yes. kids he had. Yes. <laughs> So, I'm, yeah, that's definitely a hit from you then, Adrian. yeah? Oh, yeah. Okay. What about you, Mike? We, you know, I presumably by now that what... I, I want to try and pretend I'm not going to say a hit because everything's been so positive, but I do <laughs> love... If you know me, you'll know that I love the bromance, for want of a better word, uh, mm -hmm. in, that you see in a lot of the treks, so I'm always... Mm -hmm. I'm here for the kind of Kim and Paris relationship and uh, Trip and Reed are yeah. just amazing. Shuttlepod 1 is possibly a top... 10 top five episode mm -hmm. of the entire franchise. Yeah, that's and a great just one. two people talking for 45 minutes. <laughs> um, with, but She's it's got a really... lovely bum. <laughs> exactly. <God. laughs> uh, but yeah, I think it's not just that, though, his relationships with everybody. His his, his relationship with T'Pol, even though I started out being annoyed by it, wouldn't be over. Um, his kind of friendship with Archer is pretty great. Uh, I like that he's a skilled and competent engineer. He, uh, you know, does uh, whatever it is that he's doing between two warp bubbles in that one episode. <laughs> God, he wouldn't remember now. Just <laughs> abseiling between ships from Columbia to Enterprise while it's uh, doing a speed. <laughs> that was pretty cool. Uh, yeah, but uh, so yeah, hit in every way except the accent, which uh, I have seen Connor Trinia complain about on a behind the scenes thing. So yeah, yeah. he does mention it quite frequently, in, or he did mention it quite frequently in the Shuttlepod show. I've not watched it for a little while, but it did oh, come yeah. up <laughs> quite frequently. Uh, I th I think it's one of the reasons, Riker aside, that people hate that final episode of Enterprise. Well, a lot of people, you know, I'm not counting. That's because these people don't. I'm know not you counting you, Mike. Dead. Yeah, That's oh, fine. yeah, Read yeah. The I I did. And then I thought, do you know what? It's probably better if he's dead. Uh, How very dare you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just think Connor Trinia is just a great actor. I think, uh, I don't know if any of you guys have seen American Maid, that really not great Tom Cruise movie. No, but I'm intrigued. <laughs> yes, he, Connor Trinia plays a young George W. Bush. And oh. it's easily easily the highlight of the movie he's only in it for about three minutes but he is fantastic but yeah. uh yeah trip just a great character i think and he's definitely a hit for me so oh my god mike that's another one I, well, you try and pick something divisive pick something you know I'm, everybody hates. i am i'm, I'm hoping <laughs> that the next one we're going back to romulans and it's a romulan oh, character oh, I'll <laughs> i'm gonna go with nero oh nero Nero. So, yeah, this time, yeah, sod it. I'll start off with you, Adrian. What do you think to Nero? Oh, I don't. Oh, no. I mean, the actor was good and played a good bad guy, but I just don't like Nero. I think they could have done a lot more stuff with him. Um, but, I mean, the Romulans are supposed to be so bad. He's so full of hate. He lost his family. So, uh, I still don't like him. <laughs> So is that a, is that a, a miss? I kind of think Nero was a miss for me. <sighs> He's a good bad guy, but ugh, he makes me nauseous. 
Well, I don't want to watch him. That's how it goes for me. I don't want to watch Nero. Although he's a really good bad guy, I can't explain it. Okay. What about you, Allison? I had to look him up. (laughs) He's memorable. I remember who he was, yeah. (laughs) Now I know who you mean. Uh, The Hulk from Star Trek 09. (laughs) Oh, gosh. It's been so long since I've watched that. Um, I like his... I like his, uh, so I'm going to say he's a hit. Oh. I like his, like, grrr face. Um, <laughs> you are very easily pleased. <laughs> I know. You know. He looks mean. You know, he's a hit. <laughs> sometimes you just have to, like, go with your first gut instinct. And yeah. the, yeah. um, I like the, like, face tattoos. If I'm looking at the right person. Yeah, you oh, are. Yeah. yeah. He's got face tattoos. Yeah, so I'm going to say hit. Yeah. Oh, cool. Over to you, Mike. Clearly, Allison is forgetting that this jerk killed Kirk's father. <laughs> <laughs> it's not him. It's fault. He's just not, written that way. <laughs> not just Kirk's father, but Thor, the Marvel superhero. <laughs> Who just happens to look identical. But no, um... It's a weird one. I'm going to have to join Adrienne and say Miss with a little few, you know me, I always get into annoying depth, a few little provisos, which is I didn't like the idea in the movie that they decided he's he's vowed never to speak a word until he gets his revenge. So he has this little worm tongue-esque sidekick that does all of the talking for him and the demands and crap. Yeah. And it just feels like so ridiculous. So he, he comes across incredibly one dimensional because he's just basically sitting there glaring for most of the movie. Um, yeah. And I have to say, he does have some really interesting and fascinating backstory, but it's all relegated to like spin off novels and comics yeah. and things. And if it was in the movie, cool, that would be a great character. It would probably stretch him just to the side of hit, but considering it's, you know, not official canon and it's not in the film itself. I mean, I do say recommend like, search it out if you want to find out what the face tattoos are about and what his quest is and everything. And and even the deleted scene of him on, um, I think it's on Kronos, but with the Klingons, yeah. Yeah. Um, should have just stayed in the film because it it's does so much to build up more of this character other than... <laughs> so, yeah. even, even though Alison likes that. So yeah, I'm going to have to say Miss... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm 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 afraid it's gonna it, it's gonna be a soft one, but it's gonna have to be a yeah. soft miss for me. As you as you say, the 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 backstory, I think you've got a fascinating backstory, and if they dwelled a little more on that during the movie, mm-hmm. I would have probably loved the character a lot more. But he came across as very much a cipher and not a particularly great one at that, and this is you know, and he's representative of a race which, to me, at best, are a bit wishy-washy in the first place. And I think they really <laughs> needed him to, uh, you know, to show just how how these characters are affected. If you if you imagine Nero with, say, just even a fraction of the backstory of the captain in Balance of Terror, yeah, it would have served the script a lot better. And as it stands, I uh, I think I think they failed on that front. I do think the script makes his motivation just incredibly unclear and stupid as well in terms of like where he's from in our timeline because it's just kind of so this supernova happened spock tried to save the romulan people wasn't able to so romulus got destroyed and therefore you blame spock and they're gonna uh, spock and the federation and you're gonna trap them down it's like that's a bit like me burning my house down and then blaming the firefighter who tried to put the fire out because he didn't do a good enough job are you not, <laughs> like, are you not familiar with yeah. the concept of republicans <laughs> like that he's a, of why he's a villain to do this. <laughs> yeah. yeah i i just think that, that that he was sacrificed in the altar of spectacle with regards to uh to abrams they could have mm-hmm. left a few more scenes in like you say the war on uh chronos and it would have served him a lot better and as it is he's just he's just kind of there and when you've got eric banner and he's just kind of there. That's not doing anyone any favors. Yeah, I think is it Clifton Collins Jr. who plays as like uh, his little psychic that yeah. I mentioned. Actually, does a better job because he's the one that has to do all of the demands and the emoting and the actual you know being a villain part. 
<laughs> yeah. Although I will say, I do like the way when uh, Pike introduces himself, he just goes, Hi, Christopher. I, I That just seems really kind of at odds <laughs> with the rest of his character for me. And I always find that bit hilarious. <laughs> so, yeah. So it's uh, it, it's pretty much a... I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Alison. That one's pretty <laughs> much a mess on that. You'll just... You know, just hang on to his grr face. You'll be all right. <laughs> I'm cool. Nice one. So yeah, that's it for the uh, for the hit on miss section, and we're beginning. We we finally got a miss there, Mike. So it's it can only be downhill from here. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll get on to the episode itself. Spark analysis. Okay, where today we're going to be looking at unification or how Romulus discovered AI deepfakes three hundred years after the Terrans <laughs> is a. Uh, a two-part episode of Star Trek The Next Gen featuring Leonard Nimoy as Spock. It was uh, a two-episode story, uh, earning a 15.4 household Nielsen rating, drawing over 25 million viewers and making it the most-watched episode since Encounter at Farpoint, and one of the most-watched episodes in all seven seasons of The Next Generation's run. In the episode, Picard is in search of Ambassador Spock, who may or may not have defected to the Romulan Empire. This episode has been praised for the novelty and nostalgia of seeing Spock and noted for introducing a peace-loving Romulan faction. Story elements and appearances by Spock are later included in the Unification 3 episode of Star Trek Discovery, which we'll be discussing soon. So yeah, we're going to go be uh, behind the scenes, so if you want to hit that music for me, Mike. Uh, Unification originated with a suggestion by Frank Mancuso Sr., then chairman of Paramount Pictures, during the early planning of Star Trek VI The Undiscovered Country. Noting that 1991 would mark the 25th anniversary of Star Trek first airing, Mancuso proposed to Leonard Nimoy that the Star Trek original series film series and Star Trek The Next Generation should find a way to work together to mark the occasion. Accordingly, TNG executive producer Rick Berman met with Nimoy and Nicholas Meyer. Following these discussions, Nimoy and Meyer inserted several references to TNG into the film script, and in return, Nimoy agreed to appear in The Next Generation. Now, Nimoy hadn't previously appeared on the show because his asking price was at $1 million, uh, far beyond the budget of the series. However, since this episode was in some ways a teaser for the upcoming uh, Undiscovered Country movie, on which Nimoy was an executive producer and entitled to a percentage of the profits, Nimoy agreed to appear in this two-part story for a standard fee. Now, Berman recalled, We structured a deal with him. He got very little, little more than scale, union salary minimum. But with Leonard as an executive producer of Star Trek VI, what you had, in essence, was a cross-promotion, which made everyone happy. Explaining his decision to appear here, Nimoy commented, I thought that if we could do a TNG episode in which we hinted at the beginnings of a crossover between the original series and the next generation, through the Spock character, and through the backstory of Spock's character, it would be helpful to both. I thought it would be interesting to the fans to see the connection between the two stories. It just seemed that it made sense for me to make an appearance at that point. This was not the first time that Nimoy considered appearing as Spock on TNG, however. Before the uh, 1988 Writers Guild of America strike, there were proposals for him to appear in an episode of the second season to be written by Tracy Torme. I believe that was called Return to Forever. So, I missed out again! <laughs> uh, Poor Guardian of Forever. Yeah. So, uh, while Star Trek VI was inspired by the collapse of the Soviet Union, the unification two-parter too drew on contemporary real-world events, namely German reunification. To uh, Michael Piller, however, the title had further significance. He, he remarked, We're really telling the story of the unification of the original series and Next Generation, symbolically closing the gap that had always been in the fans' minds, if, uh, if no one else's between the two shows. Berman had similar thoughts. It's a validation of our series from the original series. There has been so much talk about both series in a competitive way. This is a union, a joining of the two, and that's very positive for the fans. Having now settled on the story, the producers determined that it was too expensive to produce as a single episode and decided to break it into two parts, with Spock only appearing at the end of the first part. 
Jonathan Frakes apparently didn't like that idea. He said it was a bit of a cheat, but uh, it was Jonathan Frakes, so no one paid any attention to him. Uh, Pillar hoped to write both parts, but this proved impractical. Accordingly, he turned to Jerry Taylor. She remembered that the challenge was to tap dance well enough to sustain interest, even though this highly acclaimed character, oh sorry, this highly anticipated character was not there. Are we going to be able to keep the balls in the air enough to make that first episode work? Now, as a fan of the original series, Ronald D. Moore gave some pointers to Jerry Taylor, particularly in regards to the relationship between Sarek and Spock. Taylor was then approached by Pocket Books to write the novelisation of Unification. As she hoped to become a novelist, Taylor readily agreed. However, she was only given 30 days to write the book, while also working on the teleplay. She recalled, September 91 was a month I'll never forget. I was writing part one, I was writing the novel. It was like an endless finals week. You live on coffee, you're wired, you shut yourself off from family and friends. I had no other life but unification. Part one was first broadcast in November 1991, the month before the release of Star Trek VI The Undiscovered Country. It was considered promotional for the motion picture, Spock's dialogue mentioning the movie's overtures of peace with the Klingons and the incident at Kitima, but not the outcome of uh, either. When it did finally air, although not the first episode of Star Trek to be broadcast after the death of Gene Roddenberry, the game uh, aired four days after his death, this episode memorialised Roddenberry with the simple title card which read Gene Roddenberry 1921-1991, accompanied by the opening notes to the Trek theme. Explaining the strained relationship between Sarek and Spock to Commander Riker, Picard says, sometimes fathers and sons, at which point Riker simply responds, understood, a reference to his own difficult relationship with his father, which was explored in The Icarus Factor. You'd be annoyed too if your father had slept with Dr. Pulaski. Uh, I'd, I'd, I'd have him sectioned, if I'm being honest, but there we go. <laughs> uh, at some point, Picard mentions that he has met Spock only once in the past, in... Uh, in Sarek, Picard mentioned that he'd met Sarek during Sarek's son's wedding, the son presumably being Spock, although it's never clarified in the episode. This was Mark Leonard's final appearance as Sarek. Though Leonard liked the script, he did not know he had died until viewing at a convention later on. Although uh, he felt the script was very King Lear-like and he did like it, he felt the death of Sarek off-screen was described as chintzy and disrespectful. It took James Doohan, who was at the same con, to convince him that it was actually all right because you never saw Sarek die on screen. And this being Star Trek, well, there you go. Now, the episode first establishes that Spock has become an ambassador. He would continue to refer to uh, the ambassador status after this point uh, onwards. And while conversing with Picard, Sarek mentions the many times that Spock would disobey him and travel to the mountains, as shown in uh, the animated series, uh, episode yesteryear, which we spoke about. Was it last season? I think yeah, it was. speaking of the Guardian of Forever. <laughs> yes, I'm back, bitches. Uh, this episode marks the uh, the first occurrence of the Romulan greeting, Jolan True, said by hey. the, uh, the waitress who serves the soup to Picard and Data. And one of the shots showing the Enterprise D passing through the uh, the ships at surplus depot at the surplus depot is actually a recycled shot from the best of both worlds. Oh, show. I know. Yeah, and I'm going to come over to you this point, Mike. Before I go any further, come on, let us know who's at Quaylor. Oh well, uh, being a huge ship nerd, I can tell you that that shot from Best of Both Worlds Part Two actually contains a lot of the ship's wreckage from that. So I'm not going to get into that because that's a whole other category, but you can go look that up if you want. But in terms of what's actually newly put in this episode at the Quail or 2 Depot, uh, in the obvious category, there are two Starfleet Miranda classes, a Klingon Katinga class ship is in there. And the more obscure and bizarre ones, there's a couple of concept models uh, that were proposed for the Excelsior. Uh, one of them, which has four nacelles, and one which is just impossibly long. <laughs> Uh, but because they are there, they are technically canon, and I can't remember which one it is, but one of the two was given the official class designation Alka Celsior, because somebody oh. thought that was hilarious. <laughs> That's awful. Um, oh, I know, and it, it is officially canon as well. You can look it up in the encyclopedia, and Alka Celsior class 
is a thing, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, most notably, and it is really quite cool, uh, there's a ship in there designed by Ralph McQuarrie, which was one of the concepts for the Enterprise, uh, certainly for Star Trek Phase Two, if not uh, the original series itself. So, And it's the distinctive design with the very Star Wars-y triangular drive section and uh, the smaller saucer up front, which would eventually, many years later, and with a few important notifications, <laughs> modifications, sorry, would, uh, would become the USS Discovery. So there you go. <laughs> nice one. Thank you for that, Mike. Now, <clears throat> in terms of uh, airing order, Unification 1 is the first time any Star Trek episode or movie visited Romulans. This is discounting the uh, holographic creation of the Valley of Chula, which was seen uh, back in The Defector. It, this story also marked the final appearance of Sela. Oh, there's a shame. Uh, Niral was later mentioned in the Star Trek Deep Space Nine episode in the Pale Moonlight as being Praetor in 2374. I think he appears in that episode, actually. Yeah. Well, he's, no, he says he did later appear, but this time he was played okay. by Hal Landon Jr. In Oh, no, that was in the episode Inter Armor Enim Silent Legus. That's right. Yeah. The episode contained uh, the first instance of Klingon opera in the series, as well as Worf's avid appreciation for it. Obviously, there were, uh, uh, you know, many later mentions of it in Deep Space Nine. The uh, the Romulan security team's phases appear to be, uh, how should we say this, appropriated uh, from the visitors in the miniseries V, and you know, touched up a little. Although it was established in other episodes that Data's programming prohibits him from being able to use contractions, he inadvertently uses a contraction before giving Sela the Vulcan neck pinch when he says, I've disconnected certain sensors to allow us to exit. Data successfully performs a Vulcan neck pinch in this episode, one of only a few non-Vulcans to do so. So, now, as Mike mentioned last episode, Malachi Throne, Senator Pardek, also appeared with Leonard Nimoy during his first appearance in uh, Star Trek on Star Trek, the original series, Pirate the Cage, as the voice of the Keeper. He'd also previously appeared as Commodore Jose Mendez in the Menagerie Part 1. Well, which later appeared, the cage came first. <laughs> oh, just does stop confusing me, man. The events of this story take place in 2368, 19 years before a Nero's Origins timeline in the 2009 Kelvin Timeline movie. And Lennon Nimoy recalled that his experience filming the two episodes was hectic but enjoyable, a reminder of his days on the original series, in contrast to the slower pace of feature films. Uh, this episode was Nimoy's final appearance as Spock for 18 years, excluding archive footage in Trials and Tribulations. He next appeared in the aforementioned J.J. Abrams' 2009 Star Trek movie. That's that's what we've got for Behind the Scenes. I'm going to ask, what uh, can anybody remember the first time that they watched this? I remember... I. Th I, I wasn't a frequent watcher of Next Generation back then. I had to rely on the, the sporadic releases of the tapes every so often. And when I knew that Spock was coming into this one, I, I, I just had to get it. Bought it on the first day it was released. I remember working in game back then. Oh, good grief. Uh, <laughs> took it home, watched it, and I was a little disappointed, to be honest. The, uh, the late introduction of Spock at the end of episode one and... You know, my feelings on Romulans, I've made that quite clear. So it never really <laughs> ch chimed for me. It never really struck that chord. It was great to see Spock. And, it, you know, there were some wonderful character moments in there. But the uh, the, the the Romulan plot and things like that just kind of left me cold. It's it's improved since then. But, yeah, that was my first experience. So what about you guys? Well, <clears throat> I already mentioned, well, vaguely to you that I had just to prove to you that it existed, the Next Generation videos that were all of the two partners, but edited into one long story. And I think that might have colored my opinion more positively in the case of this episode, because obviously the first time I saw it would have been on that video set, even though I'd seen other episodes, uh, you know, on Sky TV or whatever. Um, and so the first time I saw it, it was definitely as one long 90 minute thing. So I didn't have the experience of like, oh, Spock only appears at the end of an episode, because to me it was in my head, it's all one long thing. So naturally I didn't have uh, that disappointment level. Because, um, you know, he's there. Just happens to be in the second half of what I'm watching. Yeah. Uh, and I remember, yeah, I mean, 
I was just starting to get into Star Trek. It was some of the first things that I'd bought. I was a massive Next Generation fan. I'd watched the original series with my mom, and I did love the character of Spock. And I remember liking it quite a lot the first time that I watched it because of the novelty value, I suppose, more than anything. Um, and as for watching it again this time, I will uh, defer to myself later to, to tell you about that. <laughs> Fair enough. What about you, Adrian? Yeah, the first time I saw it, um, it was live. You know, the first time it had played, uh, I watched it on TV. And um, what I really remember is liking the Klingon commander and just being devastated by Pardek's betrayal. I was so sad. I wanted it to be someone else, but it turned out it was Pardek. And I was really rooting for all of that. I wanted, I wanted it to happen, you know. I didn't want it to be so... The Romulus is be so smarmy. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's what they are, though. That's what this is. What this is, you know, what what gets me. You've been we've been friends for eighty years, yeah, but you're a Romulan. You're a douche. Let's be fair. So, yeah, listen. What about you? What was the first time that you saw this? Uh, well, it would have been in my watch through a few years ago. Um, I. And I've watched things out of sequence, so I wasn't familiar with what was going on with Spock, you know, with the movies and and all of that. Um, But I love any kind of storyline where people, like enemies, come together to um, try to reconcile their differences and make their worlds better, um, put, put their sides put their differences aside. Um, so I remember, you know, having that kind of little warm, fuzzy feeling in my heart, like, yeah. Um, but also, um, you know, um, probably being on my seat a little bit, like edge of my seat, like, are they going to get captured or, you know, are they going to be okay? Which obviously they're always okay. So, um, but still kind of when you have the part, the parts split in two you wonder um what's gonna happen but yeah like watching it this time i was like where's spock (laughs) you know (laughs) um and that makes sense you know knowing kind of the background of of the situation but you're you're expecting him to be in it and it's like literally two seconds at the end yeah yeah and uh yeah speaking of uh splitting it into two we're going to go for a little break now, so uh, come back afterwards and we'll get on to discussing the episode itself. So, see you soon. Action! We're the Silver Screen Podcast. Hey there, film buffs. I'm DK, your cult movie uber geek, and I'm here with my co-host, Mike Wilson. That's right, folks. We're your guides through the world of cinema, from beloved classics to the hottest films in the zeitgeist. On the Silver Screen Podcast, we dive deep into film culture. Join us as we review movies with honesty and respect, offering our unique take on what makes them tick. And don't forget our Silver Screen Cult Classics episodes. We'll take you on a journey through the hidden gems, the cult films that deserve more love, and the stories behind them. We've a blast welcoming all manner of movie-loving guests for lively discussion and to share our love of films. Their passion and knowledge make every episode a cinematic adventure. Plus, we'll give you our own scores straight from the heart out of five stars. You'll hear our honest verdict, no matter how much we geek out about a film. And remember what Arnie said, we'll be back. So don't miss a single episode of the Silver Screen Podcast. Subscribe now to the Silver Screen Podcast YouTube channel or find us wherever you get your podcasts. Let's embark on a cinematic journey like no other. Whether you're a casual moviegoer or a true cinephile, the Silver Screen Podcast is your ticket to film magic. And cut. cut. Okay, and welcome back. Uh, yeah, we we found out what everyone's opinions were when they first watched it. I'm going to go to everybody now, and I'm going to open it, open the floor to anybody that wants to jump in. What are their general impressions of this uh, of this two part now? Um, I really love seeing Spock come back. I love him developing this little relationships with um, Detan, the kid and um data and picard but i these aren't my favorite romulan episodes it's mostly because of sila but i'm sure we'll get there later (laughs) (laughs) um yeah these episodes besides um i think a couple of moments um 
it feels like something's missing. Um, it's a little underwhelming. Um, I definitely, I mean, I would say Spock is a highlight and then some of his interactions, um, like with, with Data and the kid, like you were mentioning. But, um, like, I don't feel like Picard was really shining in this episode, um, character. I'm going to have to disagree with you on that one, Allison. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the great thing about opinions, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, I'm not saying, I'm not, I'm not attacking that. I, I personally oh, yeah. like, just to, to kind of justify myself, I personally like the connection to the episode Sarek. So I like that Picard is kind of this bridge between Sarek and Spock. And I think he's, it's, it, there's a, a kind of beauty and understated kind of nature to Patrick Stewart's performance as that go between. But he also gets a couple of really nice moments. Like, I love it when I think it's one of the Romulan pro consuls or something says, like, how does it feel to be here among your enemies, Picard? And he just says, none of these people are my enemy because they're all just like the, uh, you know, innocent children and civilians and stuff. And I mean, that's such a very Picard moment summarized in one line. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think it's really interesting to watch some of these TNG episodes after watching the show Picard. Yeah. Um, you know, because you you get so much backstory of Picard and why he was the way he was emotionally, mentally, um, his traumas and everything um, from from Picard, and you know, like that exchange between Spock and Data when they're talking about how Picard is so unfeeling and dispassionate. Um, it makes so much more sense when you know more about why he's that way. Mm. Um. But I do like that, ignoring spin-off media, I just do like the fact that this could be considered such a screw-up by Sela. the reason you never see her again is she's just summarily executed, and that makes <laughs> everyone happy. I like the idea. I think somebody it might not have made it into the audience response because I, I had so much I had to cut a lot of it out. But somebody said that they like the idea that uh, she's still somewhere quietly seething, hoping for a clever comeback to Spock's. Uh, perhaps you should. Uh, it's either Spock or Data. Perhaps you should be in another job. Yeah, it was it was Data. <laughs> I love that line. Perhaps yeah, you would be I, happier in another job. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The idea that she's for like 20, 30, 40 years, she's been quietly seething somewhere. Like, ugh. I need a good response to that. <laughs> See, as far as as far as the writing goes, I think okay, they had to have this, you know, this big to do because it's Spock and they're doing the cross promotion and stuff. But it effectively it sidelines him for the first episode because they're they're kind of treading water and they're treading water for a lot of it. There's no need to go so all out, in my opinion, on that subplot. I mean, it has some nice moments oh, yeah. in it, but. Uh, yeah. But then the the main plot is devalued, and I don't mean this as an offence to Denise Crosby. She's a lovely person. She's a, you know she's a great actress, but it takes that what is a really serious subplot and suddenly devolves it into pantomime. The way yeah. she's revealed to be the you know the architect behind this whole scheme, it just comes across as really cheap. You didn't need her either. They'd already established no. Proconsul Neral as a character and Pardek, who would eventually be revealed as a traitor. So adding Sela into the mix, especially, I mean, I, I, I love the callbacks. I've said before, you know, people say that there was no serialized Star Trek and this one having references back to Sarek and etc. And I do like the callbacks to Redemption, but I don't think you need Sela for that because I would much rather they kept it with the other stuff, like the idea that uh, Picard thinks he, he's going to get a ship, no problem, because he helped out Galron. In the recent Civil War, Galron basically not talking to him because he's rewriting history to be like, he did nothing, I did it all. And, you know, all that kind of thing. You've got enough references there to those episodes without having to be like, and remember this villain. It's just like, oh. God. Yeah. Yeah, it does seem a bit, I don't know. What do you guys think, Adrienne, Alison? I mean, Sila's storyline was interesting at first, but it just got a little, a little boring, I guess. Yeah. It just feels like there's no place for her here. Yeah. It, it, like I said, it, she she's feels very shoehorned in. Like mm -hmm. whether you love the character or not, at least her turning up in Redemption One and Two kind of made a bit of sense. Yeah, that was interesting. She has, yeah. She has a purpose and she has scenes with Picard that would mm -hmm. be 
you know, that, that actually make it valid that she's there. But then in this story, it's just like, it's it's a hat on a hat. Like I said, just leave it as the proconsul and the senator from Romulus being, yeah. you know, we are the ones doing this and Romulans will never unify. But never mind, you've got this little kid that's a little bit of hope and oh, Spock's yeah. going to stick around and everything. So you do not need the... <laughs> Without wanting to sound, uh, you know, no offense to Denise Cosby, who is a fine actress, but you don't need this mustache twirling uh, no. soap opera. Dun dun dun! It was she's... me all along. Reveal, you know. Yeah, she's. I don't yeah. think she's. She's not a strong enough character to yeah. kind of hold it, and yeah, I mean, it's to me, it's just one of a few misfires with regards to this story, but. As, I mean, as I say, I mean, one of the biggest ones for me is the whole Vulcan chip subplot, which is, yeah, it, I would agree with it that. has its moments, but it's just stretched a little too long. It's definitely stretched out. It, it's like, yeah, like you see, there's a couple of nice moments in there, but you, man, do you ever really feel that it was, it was padding. It was really stretching out the script after a while. Um, everything in part two at that bar, much as I enjoy the kind of, you know, the forearm musician lady I mentioned in the whole Ferengi coming in and everything. None of those scenes are necessary. And I forget who I was discussing this with, but I just, it, it's almost comical how redundant it turns out being because you spend both parts with Riker trying to track this Vulcan ship. And then Sela reveals at the very end, oh, that was only one of the three ships that we've got. I was like, what? So that was pointless anyway. <laughs> yeah. Like, what about the other two? <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was nice to see the. Quail or two shipyard, I'll give them the points for that. And some of the comedy stuff with the, uh, you know, Klim Tokachin was pretty good until they started getting very Berman era exploitive of Troy, which I don't love. Um, uh, yeah. What I else would can say, I say, if I had to like sum it up, it just felt a little disorganized, discombobulated. Like, let's just yeah. throw a whole bunch of stuff in there. And it's just, it's such, I think this is maybe an editing problem. But it so stops the main story dead every time you go to this subplot that you just, man, you just feel like, oh, this again. <laughs> Maybe and, like uh, an example of like adding too much, you know? Yeah. Where you, you so, just have to take it, take some stuff back and keep it simple. Yeah. But it's like you say, like part two, I think, really picked up because that's what the moment you get Spock on screen. And I love absolutely everything in the first like five minutes of that him and Picard talking just talking in a room back and forth and whatever. And then you hard cut to like Riker, like I'm in a bar, we're tracking this guy that I accidentally <laughs> killed. And I'm like, oh, what are we doing here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it, it, it doesn't hold up, especially part one. And it, as you say, it slows the action down. You're just yeah. getting really into the, the, the plot. You know, even, even the subterfuge, I can get on board with some of it and the Romulan side of things. And then it just goes back and it just stops it dead. And then you've got to pick it up again and pick it up again. And I think for every great element that there is to this story, there's something in the story that works against it, like Sela, like the, you know, the constantly going back to Quaylor. And I think it's such a shame because the parts with Spock and the parts that dwell on the actual plot are really quite well done for the most part. Mm -hmm. There's some yeah. absolutely brilliant writing in this. I mean, when you look at those scenes with uh, Spock and Data, yeah. and they're comparing the the humanity, I just think mm -hmm. it's it's just fantastic. Some of it, it's, it's pure yeah. gold, but it, it's it's situated in a, a big pool of meh. I would add to I would add to that as well the scenes at the end of part two where um, what is it? it, it Picard gets rightfully annoyed because he says to Spock, you, you keep accusing me of speaking with another man's voice and I'm my own man, sir. And then uh, I think, I can't remember how it comes up, but Picard just with the devastating comeback of, is it really that important that you win one last argument with your father? <laughs> it's just like, yeah. Oof. But, but then the Spock's come back, he says, you know, how strange that I should hear him so clearly after he is dead. Yeah. And you just say, oh, there's some, there's some absolutely killer lines in this. Oh, really and, and even stuff. his response to that, though, like, oh, was it important you win one last argument? Well, it was in the end the arguments that were all we had. Yeah. It's such a, a beautiful and devastating line. Like, if it was, as you say, if it was kept to that, and I mean, this episode, it's huge that it's a full stop to that Spock and Sarek relationship that we've followed since season two of the original series, you know? I have a question for you guys. 
So if you could strip this episode down or these episodes and I don't know, let's say like we're in an alternate universe and you can remake them. How would y'all set them up and make them? I would probably get rid of most of the quail or stuff. I'd keep yeah. the Zach Dawn yeah. and just yeah. have the Zach Dawn scene and maybe a little extra just to show, you know, about the Tripoli and all that kind of stuff. But there's no need to just keep stressing on it, keep ha keep stretching I, it out. I wish they could have, and I would have potentially done this if I was a skilled writer, make more of the moral dilemma that the that Sealer and the Romulans try to pose, where you have Crusher coming on saying there's somewhere requesting medical aid that we need to be. And Riker's like, oh, very suspicious it's happening now. I'm just going to stay here. And they breeze past it. And I'm like, you could really have explored that for a while and been like, mm, could be true. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I mean, I mean, <laughs> or, also... like, why did we even need that subplot? Like, why couldn't, you know, a lot of times episodes, like, they don't, well, you know, they're going off and doing something, but they don't actually yeah. show it on the screen. Well, it was purely to give the rest of the cast something to do. Because everyone but that they, remains on the Enterprise wouldn't have had a plot otherwise. It would have been Data and Spock, Data and Picard and Spock on Romulus, which could work. I mean, those need to be like that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, but, I think in this day and age, with TV the uh, the day it is the way it is now, sorry, I think you would probably get that, and they'd just admit that. Well, it's a uh, you know that's the nature of the episode. It's just focusing on these characters. Like I mentioned earlier, look at, past... look at uh, sorry, sorry, go on, mate. No, I was saying like I mentioned earlier, look at Shuttlepod One. I think there's a very fleeting sort of lip service cameo by most of them. And then 42 out of 45 minutes or whatever is just Connor Trinia and Dominic Keating because but it's they, their episode. So just let yeah. it be theirs. Exactly. <laughs> like, I think, I think it would have been a lot stronger if they would have done something like that because it just felt like there was a lot of just stuff thrown in because, because they had to check some boxes. There's also that scene, and, and to me, they breeze past this, where they get that message from Picard, and mm. it's carrying the right identifier codes, and Riker, on this hunch, just says, nah, I'm pretty much ignoring that. And the look on yeah. Worf's face is like, what the actual... And and it's, and it's But after that, it's just completely forgotten about. Right. And I'd like, love to see a little... You, like, why yeah. are you not listening to the, the captain's order? That's yeah. the one thing. The one thing I did. The one thing I did like about those subplots, and the one thing I again wish they'd focus more on, is that I love we're actually seeing Riker as a captain because he's been left in charge, and so he is. You know, it's cool that he's doing that. But again, like you said, when it comes to the big decisions, they just breeze past it, and it's just like he magically knows because he's just that good. Yeah. You know? it's like, oh come on, it's the power. You can do the better beard. than this. Yeah. <laughs> But I have to say, I'm... just uh, bef before you move on, not to just sound like I'm being deliberately uh, obtuse, but I have to disagree with you in terms of part one, where you said, you know, because Spock doesn't turn up, it's not that great, etc. I actually think a lot of the stuff that's not connected to Spock's plot in part one is way better than the random, you know, bizarre bar stuff or whatever in part two. Because part one has the really cool or the really strong Sarek scenes in it, which I think really make that episode. And even... It's completely superfluous to the plot and you don't need it, but the little bit of comedy with Data and Picard on the Klingon ship, like I little like things like, like Data saying, you know, you may take the shelf, sir. Uh, <laughs> you know? Or yeah. Picard not being able to sleep because he's just like, what are you doing? Um, why are you staring at me? I'm not staring at you. I'm just, you know, <laughs> doing my files or whatever. And That's what I'm saying. That there is great. good stuff. There is some good stuff in this, but it's dragged out for too long. I don't know how you would have got around it because, you know, to get such, such scenes like that in and the Sarek, I mean, if it was just, if it was just Spock and you had to write it down, you would probably end up losing Sarek and that would be a shame in itself. Because oh, yeah, Sarek that would be devastating. Is yeah. that those scenes with Matt Leonard are just phenomenal. They're incredible. But, yeah. but as I say, there's, there's, they're sporadic. There's, some really good stuff there but it's just in this miasma of i'm not gonna it's not season two season one and season two bad but there are some real oh god really Can I, yeah. <laughs> but yeah i i think kind of i mean do you guys have anything else with regards to the writing no I, for me they covered it all yeah for me it's been covered yeah okay, okay. Okay, so we'll, I, we'll... I I just oh, want to shout out. I think um, 
as much as I don't like the Robins in this episode for much of the same reasons as you, I do think it was quite a powerful and shocking moment when they just destroyed their own invasion force. <laughs> just like, wow. All right. <laughs> I, 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 maybe I've been desensitised to it because of, you know, obviously watching the, the later episode and watching it so uh, recently, you know, with uh, Quality of Mercy. It's... It, but it... it <sighs> I'm sure maybe at the time I would have found it shocking, or maybe not, because at the end of the day, it's just it's Romulans being Romulans. They're just, <laughs> it, I hate them. I just this is it, this is one of the storylines to me that make me so vehemently opposed to Romulans being in anything, oh, oh, oh. because they're just st- so stereotypical. And any little snippets that you get of. Uh, you know, a different side of that society, like the the kid with the the symbolic uh, toys Vulcan and stuff like that. Yeah, any snippet you get of that is immediately kind of brushed aside for yet another Romulan being shady, yet another Romulan mm. being shady. They're, they're always there, they're always saying, look how Machiavellian we are. And you mm. just think, oh my God, you are so freaking obvious all the time. It's, it's just, yeah. yeah. So... I mean, the, this yeah, this episode, I mean, I picked it for the Romulan series because obviously it is about them. But if we're looking at it from uh, what are the Romulans like in this episode point of view, you're right, terrible. Because with the exception of that one little kid in the Romulan underground giving you that little bit of hope, they all just turn out to be, oh, you were shady and betrayed yeah. me, of course. I, I mean, <laughs> I actually, for a while, because I'd, I'd forgotten it from, from the last time I watched it, for a while I was actually buying into the Pardex stuff. I thought, yeah. oh, we've got a decent Romulan character. Oh, no. Look, there he goes again. The other shoe's dropped. He's a git. Exactly. Um, I want to say as well that re- with regards to part one in terms of how I would make it better, there is some incredibly clunky exposition, which I don't normally notice, but like scenes where they'll put Pardek up on a screen and then Data just describes his encyclopedia entry for the next two minutes. It's just like, come on. You can, yeah. you can be better than this. You can be more subtle than just an info dump on who this guy is because we need to know. You know, yeah, but, uh, yeah, and uh, yeah. What else was I wanting to say? Oh, just another great line, which uh, it's. It, some people might complain and think it's uncharacteristic, but I do love that Picard says to Sarek, "I also know that you love him," and Sarek responds, "Tell him, Picard." So I kind of hope um, it did. <laughs> yeah, there, and, as I uh, say, there are some good lines in this, and this, and I mean, it's, he's bringing us on to acting now, but there's some amazing delivery of the material that they're mm. given. When the material is good, and I mean, it, yeah. I'm, I'm, I was never one to take Riker seriously as a kind of threat. So the whole, you know, I will be very displeased when he's, you know, I, I just don't like the scene of him beating up the Ferengi because it just doesn't no. seem very, very starfly of him to be like intimidating get, him like he's Don Corleone and like no but I do like <laughs> I on. do like the way Frakes delivers that line where he says use your sleeve use one of their sleeves I don't care I, yeah. I do like that kind of thing and there are some really good parts in it like that but again they're just the, perfor- the performances when they are good to me aren't necessarily given enough time to breathe because then you moved on to another dull section or another yeah. section where people are you know hamming it up and yeah yeah but i think i have um i have a couple of really nitpicky questions and things that i wanted to bring up that i, I was aware of in the episode if you don't mind yeah go for um, it first of all in terms of when they're making the robin disguises and stuff if they can make data's skin look perfectly normal like that why not just keep it like that all the time <laughs> why the yellow weird thing uh, oh, I never thought about that one. He doesn't want to wear the makeup. He just wants to be himself. We've mentioned before, like, oh, I don't like that I look so different because uh, his creator just couldn't do human skin or whatever. And it's just mm-hmm. kind of like, well, we seem to have perfected it now. <laughs> Stick Robin it that way. Skin. He yeah. doesn't seem the to same. Mind. He doesn't seem <laughs> to mind looking different. He just wants yeah. to experience the emotions. I don't know. That, the boy I queen almost won him over by giving him a human, uh, you know, half fist. I think that's kind of testament to Data, though. He doesn't care about appearances. It was it was a bit of a nitpick, but I just thought, hang on, they could have at least explained how what what or, or said that it was difficult in Data's case or something. Um, yeah. My other issue is this uh, surplus depot. It's not even a shipyard. The surplus depot was supposed to be for like damaged and completely wrecked ships. 
Yet the Enterprise, a brand spanking new galaxy class ship with no hint of damage, simply powers down and it's not going to look suspicious that they're there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and related to that, how dumb is the guy that runs this? I mean, I mean, we know how dumb he is, but the idea that he just beams things to these random coordinates every day that are supposed to be the Tripoli e and just takes it on faith that that ship's there. He could just be beaming that crap into space for all he knows. Like, yeah. Go and look. How lazy are you? <laughs> There's really no quality assurance going on at that place, is there? <laughs> exactly. That was it. So, oh, okay, fair enough. So, yeah, let's get on to the acting. And, you know, any standouts? I, th I think I know what's coming, but, yeah. What do you guys think to the acting in this one? Well, I really liked Data and Spock together. I just think they did so well. Mm -hmm. um, so, Brent and Leonard. Um they, I, I feel like out of everyone, their dynamic had the most chemistry and they worked off of each other so well. And they kind of understood each other. Yeah. I think I it was like I, I would just be repeating myself. So I would just refer you back to my previous comments about obviously Leonard Nimoy, all of the quotes there, him, Patrick Stewart, Mark Leonard, Brent Spiner, even including for the comedy bits. Uh, Denise Crosby not being good on the opposite side, liking uh, Freaks being in charge a bit. And other than that, there's not really much else for me to say on the acting. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I don't even hold Denise Crosby responsible. Oh, not at I all. Think yeah. For, I, I, you know, I just think what she was given and what she was asked to turn up and do, I, yeah. I just think it's it was... uh, It's very much like that old story about uh, Star Wars, isn't it? Harrison Ford telling George Lucas, look, you can write this ship, but you can't see it. Yeah, yeah. There, there needed to be some of that here, and you know, with the best will in the world to Jerry Taylor, maybe she was stretched a little too thin back then. I did find um, it a really weird coincidence that part one of this story is, what was it? Um, story by Rick Berman and Michael Piller, teleplay by Jerry Taylor. So it's actually written by the three creators of Voyager. <laughs> that explains uh, that episode. How very dare you! Voyager is a fantastic series. Don't bring up that boxing episode. That's Let what I'm on go. about, mate. That's what I'm on about. Oh, Tutsanke or whatever? No, no, the boxing one, not the wrestling. No, oh. the, the fight, the Chakotay. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, Chakotay's <laughs> boxing, yeah. <laughs> Adrian was ready to take up arms then, and when you describe what episode it was, she went, yeah, fair point. Oh, yeah, fair point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. exactly. oh, yeah. That one, yeah. I love that it's your white whale. It's, it's the one episode you just can't bear. <laughs> I just, yeah. It is. It is. I can take any amount of crap, but that one, that just takes the biscuit. <laughs> Just, just well, just for the fact that it was the last appearance of Boothby. Come on, I know, Aww. right? That's such a shame. Yeah. But yeah, anyway, back to uh, back to this. And uh, what about you, Adrian? What any standout performances in this one? I love Leonard Nimoy. I'm just going to give it to him. Yeah, he's great. He's always great. He never misses a beat, does he? Whenever he plays. No. Uh -huh. no. This, this is. I think this is why people sometimes have such a hard time accepting, you know, with the best will in the world. Peck is fantastic as Spock, but this is why, to a lot of people, Nimoy will always be Spock because he inhabits that character so much. He's done it for so long, and yeah. it's it's just effortless. I think it's also why a lot of people during his lifetime had real trouble separating actor from character, and why he has two autobiographies, one of which is called <laughs> yeah. I'm Not Spock, and one of which is called I Am Spock. <laughs> yeah, just it's just like... Yeah, that. it's just like, all right, I give in. Go on, you <laughs> browbeat me into this. <laughs> yeah, precisely. Did any of you ever meet him? No, I wish. No, I wish unfortunately. I was just wondering how much of him is like... Or how much of Spock is like him, like how much he put into. I think in, in interviews and stuff I've seen towards the end of his life, I think he admitted there was actually a lot of uh, of the influence there. You know that they were more alike than he cared to admit when he was younger. Mm -hmm. And I know it was it was definitely him that came up with the Vulcan salute because it's based on an old Jewish letter yeah. or something. Um, oh. So he's definitely responsible for that. I didn't know um, that. 
cool. it was also his idea. I think he came up with not not the exact nature of it, but it was his idea. He didn't want Spock to ever uh, engage in violence, so he wanted something that would incapacitate people in a way that didn't have that connotation, which is what eventually led to the Vulcan neck pinch. I think so, that's so cool that he had so much input on yeah. his character development. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. So yeah, what about uh, Mark Leonard? Anybody got anything to say about Mark Leonard? I mean, he did have a relatively, you know, very short appearance, but I think he did so much with it. Just incredible. I mean, it's not as good as his performance in the episode Sarek, which we're not here to talk about, but that is just exceptional when he's breaking down in that episode. But in this one, it's just. Mark Leonard playing Zarek, telling Picard to tell his son he loves him. I've waited at that point. I'd waited like what twenty something years for that. So it was, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, thankfully, I've not had anyone close to me suffer from you know things like dementia mm. or Alzheimer's. I can yeah. only imagine how heartbreaking it must be sometimes to watch an episode like this when you've been in that situation and watched a loved one. You know, break down like that, especially. About, but it, it bring it into the fantasy context of like, especially for a species whose entire thing is controlling your emotions and then losing that control. Right. And I like that they kind of acknowledge that with Spock because he still refuses to believe it. So when Picard does finally say, you know, he at the end he really did care for you. I, uh, you know, he he made a point of expressing that, and Spock says, "Oh yes, well, lack of emotional control is a symptom of his disease." And Picard's like, "No, it wasn't. It wasn't about that. It was just what he actually felt." <laughs> yeah. Um, which is very much, you know, how it is to have dementia, Alzheimer's. Yeah. You know? um, yeah, I think he did. I think he did a great job. Um, and I love that the continuity, you know, of being able to keep the same actors throughout mm -hmm. different John or different versions of Star Trek. Um, I just, uh, like we've kind of already said before, I feel like more could have been done in those kind of things if there wouldn't have been as much of the fluffy stuff added. I was really intrigued by the extra added backstory as well, and I kind of again I wish we might have been able to get into that more somehow earlier, because it's not it's it's left to just be Perrin info dumping it a bit. But the idea that they finally fell out once and for all because Spock criticized Sarek's view on the Cardassian War, and yeah. even though Sarek was fine with it, it offended his wife, and so they haven't seen it. That's fascinating stuff to me. But again, just referring to it as something that happened in the past off screen. I think does it a bit of a disservice. So. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to uh, direction. Any standouts for you with regards to uh, the direction of the piece? I personally like the cliffhanger Spock reveals first before the credits and at the end of part one. Um, not necessarily because you've waited that long and then the part ends, but I think the actual direction of it, the way it's like shadow uh, in the cave, you don't see who it is, and then it's like almost a spotlight hitting Leonard Nimoy as he delivers the line, I think is oh. It's brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, there's a scene in, uh, I think it's part in part two, where the Picard and Data are on Romulus trying to fit in in that, you know, let's go barreling through and order soup Picard kind of way. And it's so cool and subtle the way that they gradually have more and more Romulans appearing behind them who are clearly security. And you don't notice it, it's not piling in all at once, but you just see one guy there and then another guy behind him and then another guy there. And it's like, yeah. oh, this is a really cool way of looking kind of sinister and intimidating. Um, yeah. Other than that, I can only say that I, I there were some really good shots of uh, what the Enterprise D and some various <laughs> But I, I say that about every of episode. Of course. It's like you and your <laughs> shit phone. My... <laughs> Anything. The only thing I noticed about the directing is very similar to what you said, Mike, is I loved the stuff on Romulus, the, the scenes mm. on the planet. Yeah, I thought that those are all well done. I like the use of the caves. Yeah, um, that was very well staged, the way the oh, underground yeah. were kind of on like platforms and yeah. like there was more of them, they were kind of all mm -hmm. around, you know. Mm -hmm. I liked that. And I, I liked how everyone's observing each other, like the waitress is like, why? What did he do? You know, like, ah, oh, you go. From a loyal citizen. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, Joe yeah. Shrew. <laughs> yeah, I think the caves. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, it's always cool to see how they envision different worlds. You know, 
Um, I don't know why there's always so many caves on these different worlds. Because <laughs> it's easier to make caves in the back lot of Paramount. They're probably already there. <laughs> well, their cave game is on point. Um, you know, like, let's hide in a cave. Okay. Um, which, not me. Not me. I'm not hiding in a cave. Um, too claustrophobic. But, but yes, um, I think they did a good job with the caves and, uh, and again, another thing I think would have been interesting to learn more about would have been their backstory, those people, you know? The Romulan resistance, yeah, definitely. Yeah, how did they become this resistance? You know, how did they start questioning? Another yeah. good side story. Yeah, because it's another thing Spock says, isn't it? Like, oh, the, the process is already happening. They're embracing the, the Vulcan philosophies and stuff, and so I have to stay to guide it. Like you say, it would be interesting to see when did that start because they obviously broke away from Vulcan for a reason at first and right. so now that they're coming around why did why and how did that start it's nice to see that it is happening but it's right a cool to explore. yeah you're just kind of and I don't know if it's just because we're the type of people who need to know stuff like that <laughs> like <laughs> or is it just because we're inquisitive by nature or is this I don't like need to know but I think it's like it, it could make for some fascinating sort of backstory reading or like you said the, if you were going to write novels about these things you could easily do something with it because you've got the sort of jumping off point where, where it hasn't been developed as, as heavily. I, I've got to say, direction-wise, I did love those scenes on the Klingon ship with the Klingon mm. captain. Yes, I yeah. just look that he, he's almost like everyone's ignoring him at certain points and they're just getting on with it. And the look of incredulity on the guy's face mm -hmm. as all these events are happening around him. I love that. I think there's some brilliant little comedic moments there. Yeah. Plus, like, uh, every Klingon captain's fantasy, he gets to confront Picard. He gets to say, you, do you know what they will do to you when they find out who you are? You know what I mean? I, I, have to say I love well, that I impression. Was... That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you... Yeah, that was incredible. All right, so we're on to uh, the FX and production design. And I've just got to kick it off. Why do they have such... God awful pink pastels in that Romulan office. I'm sorry, I have to say that. Because... Uh, I was I was waiting really on you mentioning the shoulder pads. I thought that's where you were going. Oh God, we, 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 we've <laughs> for two episodes we've gone over Dynasty in space, so that that one's pretty much covered. But Works just... with the Sealer character, doesn't it? <laughs> it's just please get rid of everything's brown. Why is everything brown? Get get something else on screen. Pastel pink. Yeah. Go back to the brown. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i kind of agree with you on that one yeah i do love that they <clears throat> they rom uh the they gave a, a romulan aesthetic to the little keyboard terminals by painting a different color and sticking three lines around the screen <laughs> they do that all the time though don't they yeah but i i don't know it's there's there's nothing that i hated on this but it it as I say, for for what it is, for what it involved, and um, the character of Spock, I think it was a. I don't. I, I'm not expecting to, you know, for Spock to come out dressed as Joseph in his technical dream coat, but <laughs> to put him in in those shoulder pads, almost seems like yeah, we're gonna have Spock, but we're gonna be flipping him the bird while we're doing it, and it just it. <laughs> It, I, I've got to I say, it doesn't know. bother me with Spock. All of the Romulan characters, it really bugs me, but not so much with Spock. <laughs> they must have really wide corridors on Romulus. That's all. That's <laughs> <laughs> where they hide all their secret uh, guns and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> their shady just, just, They're all just in their shoulders. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm visiting now some kind of like a, an airplane slash top secret deleted scene <laughs> where someone just flips open one of their shoulder pads and there's like a packed lunch in there or something. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah, anybody else have anything on the production design? I, had, I do have a couple of positive things, just to counter you for a second there. I love the establishing shots of Romulus, which I presume are matte paintings. But, my word, they look gorgeous. Especially in the HD on the Blu-ray, which is what I watched. But I have to say, because everybody's going to be expecting it, so, yeah, great shots of the Romulan uh, Vulcan ships and the warbirds and stuff. Yeah, very nice. <laughs> Definitely. And the Dideridex are then showing up, showing everyone who's boss, and then bugging out. Yeah, turns up, destroys three Vulcan ships full of their own troops, and then disappears. Yeah, it. Uh, <laughs> we'll go to the feedback in a minute, but before we do, come on, Mike, let's see your first haiku. You want me to go first? Yeah. 
Well, yeah, if you've been listening this series, uh, we ripped off a couple of ideas. I mean, sorry, we homage a couple of ideas from uh, the Delta Flyers podcast that they're doing as they review DS9. Wasn't planning on it, but Adrian turned up on our first review with the fantastic Limerick, so I decided I was going to have to step up and do haikus to go alongside them. Uh, so I've actually got two for this episode, one for each part. Uh, and again, if you're not familiar with haiku, uh, I believe it is a three-line poem where, where the first line is five syllables, the second line is seven, and seven, and the third is five again. Uh, and yeah, so with that, I'm going to give you my... Do you want just the first one for part one for now? Yeah, go for it. So um, my uh, my haiku for unification part one is as follows. Sarek is dying. Spock is with the Romulans. Picard just wants sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I like yeah. that. Yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> right, come on then, Adrian. Beat that. All right, I've got three, but uh, just tell me if you want me to keep going. All right. This fat Ferengi is not neat, and Riker shows a musical beat. Picard likes his ears, Klingon opera appears, and Sela is just so darned effeet. <laughs> she, she is that. <laughs> nice one. Oh, go on then. Let's have another. Oh, boy. Okay. A warning makes Data take care, for a Romulan beauty may take a dare. While our captain is great, and we dig his bald pate, I'm loving Picard with that hair. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is my favourite of those two. That is, yeah, that is a good one. We'll come... To- We'll come to the uh, the final ones from both of you after we've uh, after we've done the review. So, you know, we'll come round first with regards to the favourite character, favourite scene, and favourite line. And uh, yeah, we'll come to Alison first because you know she's the guest. So come on, Alison, who's your favourite character in this? My favourite character in this episode is drumroll, please. Um, Spock. Yay! I mean, Any... come on, it's Spock. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it just brings up like little happy butterfly feeling mm-hmm. when you see him. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know how this was like marketed back in the day because I don't remember, but um. You know, I can tell you because it's on the Blu-ray what the old trailers were, and my word, they were misleading. <laughs> okay, well, I was gonna say if it was done how the episode was, where he's at the end, and you're like, "What?" You know, you don't know, then that would have been super exciting. But if they made it seem like he was gonna be in both, it, the was, whole the, time. it was the second one. <laughs> uh, well, that is that is um, unfortunate. I guess it does leave you like the whole time, like we're Spock, we're Spock, we're Spock, you know. Um, cause that's how I was, um, rewatching it. But, um, but yeah, just, uh, seeing him and he's the same, but not, I don't know if that makes sense. Like clearly it's Spock. Yeah. yeah. But he, he's just a great, he's just great. I love Leonard Nimoy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't think there's anything more I can add to that because my favorite character is Spock and Alison's pretty much summed it up. So exactly. Cool. Yeah. Same you here. next Adrian. Oh, same Mike. Yep. Yeah, same. Yeah. <laughs> I explained my reasons why. <laughs> Plenty of times. <laughs> uh, okay, then. So we'll come around uh, the opposite way this time. Uh, so we'll start with your favourite scene, Mike. My favourite scene, as I kind of alluded to, is at the very start of part two, where um, Spock and Picard are having their discussion, and the they kind of start a bit more antagonistic with Picard saying, you know, if, the, if you're going on a mission with repercussions for Starfleet, you've got to tell Starfleet. Uh, then they get into discussing Sarek, and I particularly love with um, uh, Spock saying to Picard, you know, in your own way, you are as stubborn as another captain of the Enterprise I once knew, and Picard responded, <laughs> I am in good company, sir. Mm. That was a great line. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What about you, uh, Adrian? The meld at the end. Oh, that is beautiful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's my favorite. Such a good cool. ending. Oh, yes, <laughs> look on his face. Like yeah. closure, I don't know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Exactly. Nice, Allison. What about you? Mine is the um, interaction between Spock and Data. Um, they're sitting there 
doing something on their cool little computers. And I actually wrote out the dialogue. Do you mind if I share it? Not at all, because that's my favorite scene, so go for it. Okay. All right, so we start with Spock, and he sits down. He says, he intrigues me, this Picard. In what manner, sir? He's remarkably analytical and dispassionate for a human. I understand why my father chose to mind meld with him. There's an almost Vulcan quality to the man. Interesting. I had not considered that. And Captain Picard has been a role model in my quest to be more human. More human? Yes, Ambassador. Fascinating. You have an efficient intellect, superior physical skills, no emotional impediment. There are Vulcans who aspire all their lives to achieve what you've been given by design. You are half human. Yes. Yes, you've chosen a Vulcan way of life. I have. In effect, you've abandoned what I have sought all my life. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's my favorite as well. I like that. I like um, that a lot. Yeah. There's there's just so much. That's just so... There, it's, it's only, what, one, two, three, four... It was like a minute. Like a minute and 15 seconds, I think. Because I recorded it on my phone so that I could go back and transcribe it. There's so much depth in that minute and fifteen seconds. Yeah. Yeah. Is that your is that your favorite line also? Or do you have anything else from the I that and then I like the one that Mike mentioned about your you remind me of another stubborn captain. Um yeah. But but I would think um yes, this whole dialogue would be my favorite line. Cool. Uh Adrian? My favorite line is not words, it's Spock's expression when he gets the meld message, like when the way yeah. that Leonard Nimoy, uh, like Allison said, closure, um, he shows uh, just a twinge of emotion, but he's happy and sad at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. What about you, Mike? Well, Alison took mine uh, for the most part, so I'll go with the bit she didn't see and say that I love the the, the last part of the exchange, where um, Data simply says, "When you look back at your life, do you find that you miss your humanity?" I have no regrets. Mm, curious, no regrets. It's a human expression. Yes, fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> that is good. I've I've got two, uh, but one of them, it's more a moment than a than a line my first one is i was involved with cowboy diplomacy as you describe yes. it long before you were born i love that uh but the second one is and i think it's down to nimoy's timing as well and i it makes me laugh every time where data does the vulcan neck pinch and he just goes not bad yes i like that too <laughs> yeah Oh, and so, I forgot, I, I, I didn't oh, call this one, but we haven't mentioned it yet. I do really love uh, when Sela says, you you know, you're going to read this message or I will kill you. And Spock says, well, logically, since it's safe to assume you're going to kill us anyway, I won't comply. And she's mm -hmm. just like, I hate Vulcan logic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant. So, yeah, that's that's our favourites. We'll come to our conclusions in a moment. But before we do, as always, we ask on social media what, uh, what you guys out there think of uh, this episode incoming transmission and yeah it's another one where we got a, an absolute bunch of it so mm. uh, yeah uh, you've divided it between us all mike is that right i have yeah again apologies I, I wasn't able to use everything because much like balance of terror there was just so much in the end coming in all week um but i've tried to get as much as i could to give a decent uh, a decent amount and give a chance of everyone to get to uh, get hurt cool uh, so yeah, we'll uh, we'll we'll go around and we'll, we'll we'll again we'll start with Alison. So if Alison, if you want to read your feedback, and then we'll go Adrian, Mike, and then I'll finish you off. Okay, let's see. Alison and Adrian's, by the way, are from the same group. I think they're both from Star Trek Wholesome posting this uh, is on true. Facebook. Yes, it is. All right. So George Covert Jr. gives five out of five. And then we've got let's see Justin. Dutko, four out of five, simply for the fact that 
the Romulans really think that a couple thousand troops would stand a chance against the Federation without this becoming a full-scale invasion and full-scale war just seems a little contrived other than other than that this was an excellently written episode. Uh, Michael Coombs, I love it and still do. Ambrose, they are the sort of episodes that make me wish multi-episode arcs in serial television were more were in vogue in the early 90s. Sela is a sorely underutilized and underdeveloped entity and deserves so much more attention. Yes, yes, I know she appears in novels. I just don't enjoy the novels as much as television. Um, okay, we've also got Bob Smith. Great episode. Dr. Chen was a very good character, a vital part of the plot with some humor mixed in. Jim Butita, three, maybe 3.5. Henry Peterson gave five stars. And then last but not least, Philip Walton. I think that this episode is so good that it doesn't feel like a crossover. Certainly it's wonderful to see those characters again, but seeing Nimoy and Leonard feels very much like seeing Crosby. Exciting, but natural. Unification is some of the finest writing, direction, acting, and production of TNG. That was my last one. Cool. Okay. What about you, Adrian? What you've got? I got Ron Hubbard Jr. gives it five stars. Andrew Bertrand. I remembered that Spock didn't appear to the last seconds of the first part, and little kid me learned a lesson about TV and guest stars that day. <laughs> J. Eric Thompson says one of my favorites. Sean McClafferty, I loved it. Honestly, they could have done a part two show with Spock and Data discussing power consumption of weather control systems on Ryza, and I'd be down. But two favorites together, it's a win. John Drabilis, pretty good. Getting Spock back was neat, and I liked the bit with the Klingons. I kind of wish we got more Picard and Data adventures, though. Mike Strange says, very good. Susan Jane Bigelow, Jolon True, some pretty good spocking going on. The parts with Sela seemed a little contrived and the novelization filled in the gaps. Anthony O. Huge, huge pothole for IE. 3,000 troops to invade an entire planet, Vulcan, which is located within the core of the Federation. The response to an invasion like that would have been massive and the Romulan ground troops wouldn't have stood a chance. Even Picard says this when he learns about the plan. Jim Butita, three, maybe 3.5 stars. Steve Button, four stars. Data screwing up Riker's hair in the simulation will always be a hang-up for me. Tom Inslee says 10 out of 5. As a couple others have noted, I too saw this in the original run that is before streaming and bin watching. So when we get to the end of the part where Picard tells, I'm looking for advancer Spock, and then the man, the myth, the legend, steps from behind the shadow in Romulan clothes and says, indeed, you have found him, Captain Picard, followed by the words to be continued. And then we had to wait an entire week to find out what in the Riker on Riza was going on. Youth today will never understand what we went through. At least they didn't drop this as an end of season, cliff, season cliffhanger and make us wait three months. Matt McIrvin says the scene with Spock and Data are the best. George Covert Jr. gives it a five out of five. Marcus Anders. I love this episode for several small reasons. We find out briefly about Klingon opera, Fat Ferengi, and the dialogue of the Klingon Captain Cavada, played by Stephen Root. And Josiah Miller gives it four out of five. It had a lot going on, but it ended rather anticlimactically. That's it. Cool. Cool. Go for it, Mike. Uh, yeah, well, I've got one by, uh, it's from at cjdubois.bsky.social. Uh, easily one of my fave TNG episodes, if not my number one fave. And the scene between Spock and Picard is just great writing and acting. Uh, from the Star Trek Strange New Worlds Facebook group, Wim Win gives it 4.5 out of 5. Uh, Monica Ishak says Unification 1 and 2 are my favorite episodes. Spock and Sarek are amazing. Terry Siders Burger says Great episode, very believable. Michael Macbeth simply says 5 stars. Mary Valco Diggins says I just love Spock. Michael Zarillo, uh, very good TNG two parter. 
uh, on my personal Facebook, um, Tyler Weddle said four stars. Star Trek predicts deep fakes used as political misinformation tools to stage an invasion 30 years early, <laughs> as you said. Uh, back on the Strange New Worlds group, uh, Raymond Gothy says, when I saw Sarek appear on Enterprise TNG at his age, I figured Spock must also be alive and should make an appearance soon. It was good that the writers have tied in the old and the new. Good continuity. Uh, Christopher Huey says, I'd give it a four out of five. Curtis Matthew just gives it a thumbs up. Uh, over on the Nerdy Up North community, Graham Donaldson says, I'd say a four out of five. Get some great data bits and subplot. Nice lore on the Romulans and getting to see their planet. More Sela is always good. And it continues Spock's law a fair bit. Uh, over on Star Trek Family Facebook group, Melanie Jean Mayfield says I'd give it 4.9 stars. I'd like to see a follow-up on reunification over the subsequent decades slash centuries, to which I replied, watch Star Trek Discovery Season 3. Uh, Sarah Davis says I felt it was a letdown when I saw it, but I probably built it up more in my head than I should have. Uh, at strange new words dot b sky dot social <laughs> uh, says five out of five having Spock and Sarek would have made it an instant classic but that wasn't good enough for TNG so they threw in even more great stuff like Sela, Pardek, Stephen Root as a Klingon, the Zach Dorn superintendent the four-handed piano player the fat Ferengi, the Klingon opera scene dot 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 uh, Brian Wood says it's crazy that Spock was even alive at that point to which Jason Todd, and I hope that's your real name, buddy. Apologies for what the Joker did to you. Uh, simply responds, <laughs> why the Vulcan lifespan's around 200 years. Spock was only 138. Uh, and Amy S. Sid Shah says, there are only four stars. And then puts the gif of Picard saying there are four lights. And that was it. Nice one. <coughs> uh, I've got one from uh, Ships of the Line group. I believe that's Facebook. Is that right, Mike? It's a Facebook group, yeah. You got uh, all yeah. of those. I think are from there. <laughs> okay. Uh, Candace Chowdhury says one of my favourites. Five. Uh, Jim Goff and Don Hilton both give it four. Jeffrey Ecker says part one is a five, part two is a three, and Wim uh, Win then uh, replies so a four. <laughs> uh, Jason Benjamin Dunham gives it five stars. While uh, Michael Craig Wording gives it the same. This is five stars from me. Wayne Moran says easily two of the best episodes in all of Trek. Okay. Uh, Paul Zoller <laughs> says a five. David Stahl gives it an easy five. Uh, Alexander von Petersdorf says great episode, except the reappearance of Denise Crosby as Sealer. I don't have anything against Denise Crosby. She does a great job, but the backstory is way uh, too much constructed to make her the villain. For that reason, it only gets four out of five. Uh, John Mead gives it 4.5 out of 5. And Jonathan Baker says it's one of my favourite story arcs. Brandon Barber gives it 5. Absolutely great Star Trek. A plot that could easily have been a movie. Yeah, see Nemesis, dude. Uh, Brian Snavely gives it a 5. Uh, no seatbelts on the bridge. Says originally a 3, but when I learned uh, that Stephen Root played a Cleon Commander, it went to a 4. Uh, David Fox says 4. I have no regrets. Sat Gill gives it a six. Uh, Wendell Molly says brilliant writing. Pity they didn't use any boy more. And Christopher Sim says three point five. Some obvious plot holes. Nice to see Nimoy at his senior best. Worth a rewatch. And I'm going to end on uh, one from Boom Roo, who frankly is well in my wheelhouse, and so we have to have them on as a guest. Uh, they simply say, <laughs> well, on a scale of Wrath of Khan to Event Horizon. I'd give it gummy bears. <laughs> I, yeah, I definitely saved that one to give you to read out. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's my kind of person. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that's that's what you thought of it out there. And uh, if you agree, if you don't agree, if you just generally want to slag us off or hate us for having, you know, obviously superior opinions, that's fine. You can get in touch with us on our social media. And that goes for you uh, new listeners, hopefully there are some, on the Federation Subspace channel. Just hit us up on Facebook. It's the uh, Star Trek Hit or Miss podcast. So, yeah, just hit us up on social media if you want to give us your opinion for this or any other upcoming episode. And, we'll, yeah. you know, we'll give you the details on that. Our, um, I should say our Instagram is HOM Star Trek. Ah. Uh, 
get on on there, and uh, I'm on there fairly oftenish, and just look up here on Miss Star Trek on uh, all the other random blue skies and mastodons, etc. You'll find it. <laughs> there. So uh, yeah, we'll come to the guest first. So uh, Alison, what's your final thoughts on this one and your score out of five, please? Final thoughts. Um, could have been way better if they would have stuck to like the meat of the story um, and kept it simple and not added in all the extra bits. So with that being said, I give it a 3.5 out of 5. Cool. Adria? Can somebody get me a napkin? Oh, sorry. Um, Use your sleeve. (laughs) Use that sleeve. I don't care. (laughs) I give it a 4 out of 5 because Spock. But a lot of the other (laughs) things... No, but four is not that bad. That's my that's my opinion. Cool. Mike? Uh, a bit of a mixed bag at times. In the past, we've concluded that some single episodes would benefit from being two-parters. See our Blood Oath review. This feels like it could have been a superior single episode, certainly of the longer, longer length afforded to Star Trek these days. The subplot of tracking the one stolen Vulcan ship just seems like padding and ultimately unnecessary, despite some slight amusing and entertaining moments. Part one is too slow to get to the eighth plot, but is saved by the scenes with or about Sarah and a genuinely funny bit of business on the Klingon ship. Part two, though, is another level. From the moment Spock appears on screen, he elevates things. Every scene with him is engrossing, captivating, and fascinating, I had to say. Ultimately, he, along with the hints of the more complex Romulans in the underground, saved the unification plot and keeps the silly attempted invasion stuff to a minimum. Not a classic or perfect story then, but the through lines involving... Fox, Sarek, and Picard, and the overall character work are strong enough to still make it very good and worthy of four out of five. Okay. All right. Bear with me. I'll get my essay up. Uh, yeah, I wasn't impressed with this uh, upon first watching it. It felt it dragged and took too long to get to the good stuff that, you know, let's be honest, most of us were here for. Spock. That being said, it's grown on me a great deal since then. Yes, it has the Romulans and all that baggage that entails, so it's never going to be one of my favourites. But it's got enough redeeming qualities throughout its double run time for me to appreciate and even enjoy it on some occasion. There's some good performances on this one, which lifts the material from spinning its wheels, as it often feels like it's doing, the, uh, the ship subplot especially. And yes, it's Romulans, and yes, they're, uh, you know... They're every bit as two-dimensional and dull as I remember. The overriding brown palette, only offset with those 1970s doctor's waiting room pastels in the pro (laughs) console's office don't help. Yes, we see a new side to them, but oh look, there's always a slippery, devious git to bring it back to well-trodden territory. Seriously, if this one didn't involve Spock and Sarek, it would be an instant avoid for me. But his presence drags it kicking and screaming out of the pile of nothingness it almost is and makes it a worthwhile watch. Not only at its own right, but for hints of storylines to come. And I've also given it three and a half. And half star is for Sarek and one star is for Spock. So, yeah. Do you want the final score? I do. So uh, that comes to an average and a final score then for Unification 1 and 2 of 3.75 out of 5. Hmm. I think that's fair enough. What do you guys yeah. think? Yeah, I'd say it's fair. Yeah, yeah I think so. Mm-hmm. Cool. So, yeah, that's what we thought of this one. Uh, so, before we go to the uh, the goodbyes, I'm going to return to uh, to Mike, because I'm not letting him off the hook. I want to hear this final haiku. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so I said, uh, Spock seeks unity, but here comes Sela. Oh, joy. Riker's hair is wrong. <laughs> 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 That's definitely my favourite. Yeah. So, come on, Adrian. T- take us over the finish line. Give us a, an absolutely fantastic limerick to end this off. No pressure here. <clears throat> Sarek. No more chaos, he yelled. For the end of his life, he beheld. Yet on his last day, still sure Spock couldn't betray. And his son thanks Picard for the meld. Oh, 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 I really like that. I've, that Aww. made me emotional. <laughs> that was beautiful. Oh, oh you, thank you. Yeah, you definitely, like you've de- you definitely pulled that one out of the hat. Nice one, Adrian. See, I'm gonna have to get involved in this on some point. I'm gonna have to start and like introduce bits of Kirk and Spock slash Vic again. 
Oh, God. <laughs> oh my God, that would be great. <laughs> oh my God. I'm never relevant unless we're looking at TUS. Like, but never mind. Hey, there's always time for Kirk and Spock slash fic. <laughs> oh my gosh, I think that's great. Or like whoever's the main character for the episode, look up some fanfic <laughs> for them. Yeah. It's, it's like DK, that. he'll make it relevant. It'll just be like Michael Burnham looked at Spock's personal files. <laughs> Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, that's it for this episode. Thank goodness. Uh, yeah, if you've enjoyed it, if you've enjoyed it, uh, then please join us next time. Uh, I believe the next episode is part three. Is that right, Mike? It is Unification 3, rather uh, logically. <laughs> yes. So leave your discovery prejudices at the door because you are wrong. And join us for that one. Uh, in the meantime... As I said before, hit us up on social media. And if you feel like it, drop us a, a tip in our coffee account. Do we still have one? Or we is... still do, yeah. It's, it's it's looking a bit bare, but it's there. Yeah. There's, there's, there's a few moths in it, but that's about it. Uh, yeah. So, you know, if you, if you like it, if you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe. Tell your friends. Share with the family. Give the gift of hit or miss. And, you know... Come back next week, and I'm sure we'll be entertaining, and if not entertaining, we'll at least make you feel better about your own life. So, <laughs> until then, Gosh. All, it, all I have to do is to thank today's guest. So, uh, first of all, thank you, Alison. Thank you for having me. Anytime. Is there anything you would like to uh, promote while you're here? Anything where the listeners can find you on social media? No, sure. I mean, I have, like, a million Instagrams, but... Um... I am working on a guided journal for my mental health side of my life, and hopefully that will be done soon. You can find that on u.r.a.r.e.among.wildflowers. Um, but my regular Instagram is Allie, A-L-L-I, who, H-W-O, Trek, T-R-E-K. And that's where I just post about random life and geeky stuff. Cool. We'll make sure we get those, uh, as always, descriptions in, 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 sorry, links in the descriptions. On YouTube. Good grief. <laughs> I need some alcohol. Uh, right. Adrienne, <laughs> uh, anything you want to promote or our social Hold media? Hold on. It's only 1030 in the morning. You can't have any alcohol. Um, not, not here morning. it isn't. <laughs> not, right. that that, not that that would stop me. <laughs> I am still on Twitter at A L Park Tucker Two. Sorry about the politics. Cool, Mike. Uh, well, after the busy weekend that I've had socially, you can find me in bed. Uh, I'm not sorry about my politics. <laughs> God. Oh my goodness! This this is just taking a turn into the gutter. <laughs> just look up my name under social media. It's Michael Wilson or some variation there. <laughs> oh, yeah, and I can be found pretty much nowhere other than on here because that's my life now so yeah that's it so we'll hopefully see you next time and uh, as usual remember we are starfleet live long and prosper live long and prosper you have been listening to the hit or miss star trek podcast hosted by michael wilson and dk produced and edited by mike wilson Additional material by DK. Please remember to like this episode and spread it throughout subspace. Subscribe to the Hit or Miss YouTube channel and follow us online. Links to all of our social media pages can be found via the link tree listed in the episode's description. For any queries or to apply to be a guest on the show, you can also email homstartrek at gmail.com. This podcast is part of the Mike's Podcasts Network. You can listen to this and our sister podcasts on all good podcast providers by searching for Mike's Podcasts. Hit or Miss Podcast was based on an idea by Michael Wilson and Will Templer. Thank you for joining us. We hope you'll be back, but for now, hailing frequencies closed. I'm going to walk out of here at once, maximum speed.